Welcome back to our course Introduction to Quantum Optics. Today we want to look at field state solutions which give rise to the classical electromagnetic waves we know from Maxwell's equations. So the Fox states we had in the last class, they were not at all like classical field states. They gave us these very strange results. Nevertheless, they can be produced in the experiment and one can, can experiment with them, but they don't give us the classical electromagnetic field solutions. And since these are the most standard solutions we have, we deal with in daily life, we want to know how quantum mechanics can reproduce these kind of classical field solutions. So this is in fact a question in quantum mechanics that has been asked a long time ago since the beginning of quantum mechanics and was first solved by Erwin Schrödinger himself. So he was asking himself the question that you might have asked yourself as well, that if you have the classical motion of a particle in a kind of harmonic trap where this point-like particle oscillates around in the trap and we can predict the position momentum of that particle precisely at any point in time, how can we get close to such a dynamical evolution or what kind of dynamical evolution can we have in a quantum system that corresponds to such a classical oscillation of a particle. So clearly this cannot be given by the eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator themselves because they are just static kind of probability distributions um, containing no dynamics whatsoever. But as in the two-level atom, we encountered already that when we have superposition states, we can have dynamical evolutions. And Schrödinger himself found out that indeed, if you superimpose these eigenstates in the correct form with correct weight factors, and we'll discuss these in the subsequent slides, these are the so-called coherent states, they will actually give you an oscillating wave packet, a wave packet that is just the ground state harmonic oscillator wave function, but now it's not static, it's oscillating around in the trap, corresponding to your classical oscillating particle. Now there are still some differences compared to the classical state, namely that, you know, for example, there are quantum fluctuations for a quantum particle, whereas for a classical particle you can predict position and momentum precisely at any point in time, but for the quantum particle there will always be quantum fluctuations. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, if you measure the position of the classical particle, it's precisely defined. For the quantum wave packet oscillating around here, we'll always have quantum fluctuations on the order of the size of this wave function. That's just the size of the ground state wave function. This can be tiny typically for a macroscopic system, so typically we don't notice these fluctuations, but when the oscillation amplitude becomes very small, uh, or we're in the microscopic regime, then indeed these quantum fluctuations can become observable. And that means, for example, if I measure the position of the particle, I won't find it always at a precisely defined position of the maximum of the wave packet, but I can find it here to the side a little bit off, given by the probability distribution of this Gaussian ground state wave functions. So when you measure it, you have intrinsic quantum fluctuations in the system. So you prepare exactly the same system over and over again. You measure the position of the particle, you will not get the same result. You will find fluctuations around kind of an average value, which is the position also of the classical particle. But these fluctuations around the average value, they are the intrinsic quantum fluctuations of the system. So the coherent states cannot get rid of that. They are our best approximation to classical oscillations that we can have in the quantum world, and that's why we like them so much. So what we want now for the electromagnetic field is exactly the same thing. We want states of light that reproduce as their expectation value the classical electromagnetic waves that we know from Maxwell's equations. And these are the so-called coherent states. I've written them down here. The state alpha, where alpha is a complex number. It's the so-called amplitude of the coherent state. It's the amplitude of the coherent state. Uh, so alpha equals norm alpha times beta di theta. And you see it's actually a superposition of different Fox states. These are the Fox states with a defined photon number. And we sum over n going from 0 to infinity with these corresponding weight factors 
given by this complex amplitude factor alpha. And we'll interpret this in a second, what this actually means, for example, for the probability distribution of photons in our system. So these are the coherent states, and we'll see that they actually reproduce the classical oscillating electromagnetic field that we know so well from Maxwell's equations. So let's check a few properties of these coherent states. Let's check, first of all, whether they are normalized. So we take scalar product of alpha with itself. That just gives us e to the minus norm alpha squared, sum n comma n prime, alpha star to the power of n, alpha to the power of n prime, divided by square root n factorial, square root n prime factorial, n n prime and this of course is only non unequal to zero for n equal n prime so that just evaluates to delta n n prime and therefore this becomes very simply e to the minus norm alpha squared sum over n norm alpha to the power 2n divided by n factorial and this is nothing than the Taylor expansion of the exponential e to the plus norm alpha squared and that cancels exactly with the prefactor and gives us one. So coherent states are normalized, that's, that's good. So what about uh, orthogonality? If I take two coherent states and calculate the overlap between them, between a coherent state alpha with complex amplitude alpha and another coherent state with complex amplitude beta, what is the scalar product? Well, you can check as a homework problem, this is just e to the minus one half norm alpha squared e to the minus one half norm beta squared plus alpha star beta. And if we calculate the magnitude of this overlap, so norm of alpha beta squared, that's just alpha beta complex conjugate times alpha beta, uh, that would be just e to the minus norm alpha squared minus norm beta squared plus alpha star beta plus beta star alpha and that is just e to the minus norm alpha minus beta squared, okay? So this means actually uh, with distance, the overlap of the states alpha and beta decays exponentially as their separation in the complex plane alpha minus beta. So if alpha minus beta is large compared to one, then the overlap factor, so norm of alpha beta tends to zero. So they are basically this exponential decreasing overlap with distance in the complex plane means they're almost orthogonal. We also call this quasi-orthogonal. We speak of quasi-orthogonality of the coherent states. One very important property of the coherent states is that they are eigenstates of the destruction operator. That's what makes them highly robust in nature. And that's very different from the Fox states. So for example, think of the Fox states, uh, Fox state N, if you lose one photon by a destroying one photon in the system, you immediately end in a different orthogonal state N minus one. Not so for the coherent state. If you apply the destruction photon operator A to the coherent state, it gives you alpha times the same coherent state. So the coherent state is an eigenstate of the destruction operator A with eigenvalue of the complex amplitude of that coherent state. Let's prove that. That's a very important property. So let's apply the destruction operator to the coherent state e to the minus norm alpha squared over two square root alpha to the power of n square root n factorial of n. And uh, since these are just, just complex numbers, we can just pull this destruction operator right through to the state n here. And uh, that will just give us e to the minus norm alpha squared over two, sum alpha to the power of n, square root n factorial. If we apply the destruction operator to the state uh, n equals zero, it gives us zero. So the first non-zero result we can get is when we apply a to the state one. So let's, put, let's still write this out. So this is a destruction operator applied to n, n from zero to infinity. And now this just gives us e to the minus norm alpha squared over two, sum n 
starting from one, that's the only thing where we get a non-zero result, alpha to the power of n, then we get square root of n, n minus one, we destroyed one photon in the system divided by square root n factorial. This gives us e to the minus norm alpha squared over two, sum n equal one to infinity, alpha times alpha to the power of n minus one divided by square root of n minus one factorial n minus one. So let's pull this alpha out in front here and let's introduce a new index k which is just n minus one. Then we see what we have here is just e to the minus norm alpha squared over two with the alpha in front here sum over k equals zero to infinity, alpha to the power of k, square root of k factorial, and k. Well, but that is just the coherent state, right? We started with, so that's just alpha. So this is just alpha times the coherent state alpha, as we wanted to show. What about the average photon number that is present in a coherent state? So we said, the coherent state is a superposition state of different photon numbers. What about the average photon number? Well, that's just equal to norm alpha squared, and we can easily show that because alpha a dagger a alpha, that's just alpha. And this a dagger applied to the bra operator here gives us an alpha star. This a operator applied to state alpha gives us an alpha alpha, so that's just norm alpha squared alpha alpha, and that's just one, so this is just norm alpha squared. So the average number of photons, the mean photon number in the system, is given by the norm squared of the complex amplitude of the coherent state. What about the photon number variance? So now we have a superposition state of different photon numbers. In the Fox state, we showed that that trivially is zero, the variance, the fluctuations that we have in the photon number. But of course, we can't expect this for the coherent state because we're taking a superposition of different photon number states. So when we actually calculate the variance, it's going to show fluctuations. Uh, what are these fluctuations going to be like? Well, let's calculate that again. Well, this factor we already know, the expectation value of alpha n alpha, that was just norm alpha squared, and I have to square that again. So that's norm alpha to the power of four, and the first factor we still have to calculate, so that's just alpha a dagger a, a dagger a. And now we will kind of benefit from normal ordering these operators by bringing all the creation operators to the left and all the destruction operators to the right. And this is just, remember, that's just a dagger a plus one. So this gives me alpha a dagger a dagger a a alpha plus alpha a dagger a alpha minus norm alpha to the power of four. So what's this? This gives me alpha, alpha, alpha star, alpha star. So this gives me norm alpha to the power of four, norm alpha to the power of four, which cancels with this norm alpha to the power of four. And this gives me here a norm alpha squared. So the variance in the photon number is given by norm alpha squared, and that's just the mean number of photons that we have in the system. So the fluctuations, the variance in the photon number equals the mean photon number for my coherent state. And the mean photon number is just norm alpha squared, the magnitude squared of the complex amplitude of my coherent state.